With the war raging in Europe, a wary President Roosevelt came to rely on Hoover for intelligence on his own political enemies. FDR gave Hoover a secret order expanding his powers to spy on subversives. It was an order Hoover would use to justify his invasive surveillance techniques for decades to come. With America's entry into the war after Pearl Harbor, Hoover once again took on the role of protecting the home front from America's enemies. But he defined that threat much more broadly than anyone suspected. Without FDR's knowledge, Hoover's targets even came to include the First Lady, long known as an activist for liberal causes. In 1942, FBI agents break into the headquarters of the American Youth Congress and photocopy the correspondence of Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. And then Hoover demands a report analyzing that correspondence so that there was an interest in knowing about the First Lady's politics. In Hoover's strict moral universe, even the First Lady was a potential subversive. Though the Soviets were America's allies during the war, Hoover was preparing for the day when he could again openly pursue communists. FDR's untimely death in April 1945 swept away Hoover's close relationship with the White House. But in the future, his power over public opinion would surpass even the president's. He would use the fear of communism to spy on thousands of Americans and define the Cold War at home. These red fascists distort, conceal, misrepresent, and lie to gain their point. Deceit is their very essence. Just as he tapped the fear of gangsters during the Great Depression and the Nazis during World War II, next, J. Edgar Hoover exploited the fear of communists to establish himself as the supreme defender of the nation's morality. We of the FBI feel that we're a part of a team to make America a great and decent place in which to live. We're on that team, all of us, together. Throughout the war, Edgar and his constant companion, Clyde Tolson, were in charge of guarding the nation's secrets and ferreting out Americans who might be blackmailed into spying on their own country. But Hoover was hiding a dark secret of his own. During the late 40s, he visited a respected Washington psychiatrist named Marshall de Ruffin. According to the psychiatrist's widow, he went to see her husband on several occasions talking about his homosexuality and then became worried, even in confiding in this doctor, he was worried that, that if he talked about this somehow, it, it, it would leak out. Former agents, still intensely loyal to Hoover's legacy, repudiate any suggestion that the director was gay. Under no circumstances would he even think about risking his job and risking the reputation of the FBI, as well known as he was to the American public, by having a homosexual relationship with anybody. Hoover kept his private and professional lives carefully compartmentalized, veiled behind his dedication to the Bureau. With the defeat of the Nazis, Hoover returned to his lifelong mission of exposing Reds. Hoover's relationship with FDR's successor, Harry Truman, was doomed from the start. Unlike FDR, President Truman didn't trust Hoover or his tactics. And to Hoover, Truman was, quote, that hick from Missouri. The fact is that Harry Truman hated J. Edgar Hoover, and he hated him almost from the beginning. He told Hoover that from now on, when you need to give me information, you give it to me through the attorney general. I once went to a doubleheader with him and Winchell to see the Yankees play. And I'll never forget, I sat between Hoover and Winchell, and we had mobs coming to us for autographs. And what Winchell and he talked about was not so much baseball but that both of them was very unhappy with President Truman and I was shocked to hear the, the head of the FBI being critical of the President of the United States. Starting in late 1945 Hoover began sending the White House urgent top-secret information naming suspected spies in the State Department but Truman simply dismissed Hoover's warnings as gossip and openly criticized the Bureau. Now I'm going to tell you how we're not going to fight communism. 
We're not going to transform our fine FBI into a Gestapo secret police. Edgar was appalled. He had spent his entire adult life fighting communists, and Truman wasn't even taking him seriously. Hoover decided that he needed to convince the American public of the dangers of communism and show them that Truman wasn't up to the fight. In March 1947, Hoover made a rare and highly publicized appearance before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. Hoover's speech gave new credibility to the committee, which launched a wave of investigations. In May, it went after suspected Reds in Hollywood, with Hoover's vital help behind the scenes. The FBI supplied names from wiretaps and break-ins. The film industry blacklisted anyone who refused to cooperate with the committee. The that's basic not principles the of American. That's not the question. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm... The entire country was now engulfed in the anti-communist blaze that Hoover, using the awesome powers of his office, had helped to ignite. From the stand. Fight for the Bill of Rights, which I'll you are trying to take destroy. this man away from the stand. The committee attacked members of Truman's administration, such as Alger Hiss and Harry Dexter White. Files declassified in the 1990s show that Hoover had access to top secret information that even the president didn't possess, all but proving that Hiss and White actually were Soviet spies. Hoover wasn't able to give Truman all of the information he had because the army had determined that it could not be used or else the Russians would know we were decoding their enciphered messages. So there must have been a, a redoubled frustration on the part of Hoover. Despite Hoover's efforts to show that Truman was failing in the fight against communism, Give Him Hell Harry was elected president by a narrow margin in 1948. Edgar had lost the battle against the president, but his anti-communist crusade was far from over. In 1950, Hoover joined forces with Senator Joe McCarthy, who had begun making wild claims that communists had spread throughout America. Even if there are only one communist in the State Department, there could still be one communist too many. Behind the scenes, McCarthy was relying on Hoover to supply a real list of names that would support his accusations. And Hoover would dutifully put his people together trying to get something that would fit the general category of what Joe McCarthy was saying. Hoover helped McCarthy as long as the senator never revealed the FBI as a source and always understood who was the original Red Hunter. Hoover's power seemed limitless. At the age of 58, he had become as much an institution as the Bureau itself. Hoover's nemesis in the White House, Harry Truman, was finally replaced by an ally when Dwight D. Eisenhower took office in 1953. President Eisenhower would uh, uh, get uh, large uh, collections of Western books, and after he read them, he would uh, pass them to Mr. Hoover, and Mr. Hoover would read them and pass them to me. Eisenhower knew exactly how to deal with J. Edgar Hoover. Before Eisenhower was inaugurated, he called in J. Edgar Hoover and said, internal security in the country, that's your job. I'm not going to interfere. He gave Hoover everything that he possibly could have wanted. Hoover soon had to balance his friendship with Ike against his close ties to McCarthy. In 1954, when Joe McCarthy launched an attack on suspected communists in the U.S. Army, Hoover sided with the five-star general in the Oval Office over the junior senator from Wisconsin. How did it get here? It was handed to me just now by Senator McCarthy. At a crucial point in the Senate hearings, McCarthy broke Hoover's cardinal rule. He revealed a letter which he claimed had come directly from J. Edgar Hoover warning the army that it was coddling communists. The Senate committee wrote to Hoover asking if he had indeed written the letter. Mr. Hoover has examined the document and has advised me that he never wrote any such letter. 
Now, Mr. Collier, as I understand your testimony, this document that I hold in my hand is a carbon copy of precisely nothing. Is that right? He could have said, well, what's actually here is a memo, a completely accurate memo summarizing a letter that I did send to the Army. Or he could have said, no, that's not a letter that I wrote. He had a choice to make. I don't think that Hoover gave it a second thought. Hoover had withdrawn his support, effectively ending McCarthy's career and yet again preserving his own. Hoover's talent for self-preservation would be tested even further as the Red Scare of the 1950s died down and he was forced to deal with the threat he had ignored for reasons of his own, the Mafia.